Welcome. Good morning, everyone. I am Gina Ness. I run the Minjaru Center for Technology and Democracy at the University of Cambridge. And I'm here wearing a couple of hats for this conversation. So I am a sociologist of work and organizations. And for the last 20 years, it pains me to say it's been that long, but for the last 20 years, I've been working on how work and organizations change in light of new technology. So my, my first book was on Web 1.0, which feels like, well, a very long time ago. So here we are. Um, brought together by the UK's hosting of the AI Safety Summit and a whole set of conversations that have come around this moment, bringing people together to talk about what else do we want to talk about when it comes to artificial intelligence and, and, and how these changes are impacting society. And that brings me to my two other hats. So I helped to co-direct at an ESRC network called the Digital Good Network with the effort and initiative to bring social science mainly into conversations about how we design, develop, deploy, and use digital technologies to benefit, to be good for people, communities, and the planet. And when we talk about what is good, the next question should always be good for whom? Please. When we talk about future of work conversations, this is exactly one of the challenges that we face, right? So, so um, enormous changes in productivity, enormous changes in how tasks are handled at work, enormous changes in what workers are exposed to. These questions of um, how can AI be good uh, um, take on a new salience, an incredible urgency and importance when we talk about workplaces. So for the last um, a, a decade, I've been watching how the construction industry, no one's definition of a high-tech industry, grapples with how to bring new kinds of cutting edge technologies into the conversation of how they design their buildings, how they organize their work, and the challenges and opportunities are, are both about the rules, the institutional configurations, and yes, the way in which people have been doing work. So I'm joined today by a great panel. Um, we're going to take, um, I, I would propose we take uh, 20 minutes for our, for our first panel, giving, giving us sort of four minutes or so um, opening salvos from each of you. I see we're sharing a mic. Um, uh, we might as well start here. So, so, I love how I'm, you have yours. Yeah. I don't oh, I see, I'm, 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 I'm so wired up. Oh, you yeah. always oh, just mine. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> I see we all have mics. We have wired the sound. Allow me, please. Thank you. <laughs> Tell us. So, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you on this panel. Um, I'm Jolene Scordis. So I'm a professor of economics at UCL, a fellow of the Institute for the Future of Work. Uh, director of the Centre for Global Health Economics, and I'm really interested in the intersection of AI and technology, both on the workforce and the well-being of the workforce. And, and so that's one of the things that I will touch on a little bit today. Do you want brief introductions or can I launch straight in? Launch straight in. Yes. Okay, great. So, um, so, so really all I can give you at, in the time that we have is a whistle-stop tour of two bits of research that, that we've done through the Institute for the Future of Work. One, a firm survey actually led by James Hayton, at Warwick Business School, hence our venue here today. Thank you to Warwick Business School. Um, uh, and that was a, a survey of a thousand firms, medium to large size firms, and they found that tech adoption is happening. Whether we like it or not, it's happening. Whether we're ready or not, it's happening. So, so almost 80% of firms surveyed had adopted some form of technology to assist in cognitive uh, or physical tasks. But that varied around the country. So while we talk about leveling up and regional inequalities, we also know that the ad adoption of that technology is determined by baseline levels of education and the infrastructure, 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 as anyone who tried to catch a train here today knows. <laughs> um, so, right, so, so we know it's happening. 
We then surveyed really 6,000 uh, employees to see, and what does that mean to people working in firms? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And this is really so hot off the press, it was literally finished in the last two days. So I'll, 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 I'll tell you what we're finding so far, and then there's a watch this space as we start to unpack some of the findings. But in short, we used four different definitions of technology, okay? Because what is tech? What is AI? We're, you know, we're starting to use lots of catchphrases without really stopping to think about what we're talking about. So we divided it into four categories. One, where um, digital information and communication technologies, almost everyone had had some access to that, some exposure to it. And the great news is that can have a positive impact on quality of life. So that was a good finding. We thought found that tech could be good for your quality of life that form of tech. Then we had three other definitions, one that was about wearable and remote sensing technologies, we had software technologies, AI, um, and machine learning technologies, and then finally automated tools and equipment. Now those three, not so good for quality of life. And what seems to be driving that is concerns about surveillance, mm -hmm. concerns about lack of control and agency, and what we need to unpack is whether that can be mitigated, whether employees can be supported. Can you still have good work, respectful work, in the context of the introduction of those types of technologies? So that's the watch this space in terms of quality of life. Where we're going next is we need to understand how this is interacting through job satisfaction. So we've got 19 indicators of job satisfaction. And when we look at them as a lump, we don't see any impact, some are pulling in different directions. So what we need to do is really drill down and find out which aspects of good work, good quality of work, are being positively affected by these different types of technology and which are being negatively affected so that we can start to answer questions about resilience, readiness. How can we ready a workforce? How can we ready a population? And of course, how can we ready firms and a country? So you know we can we can tap into the bigger policy discussions, but we do have to remember we're a collective of human beings at the end of it. And so, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Perhaps. Thank you. Thanks. Paula. Um, well, firstly, thank you to the organisers for inviting me. Infrastructure. I came down from Manchester this morning at six o'clock in the morning. The train was already half an hour late at Stockport, <laughs> which is <laughs> six miles from the centre of Manchester. So yes, infrastructure. Um, thank you, anyway for inviting me. So my name is Philip McCann. I lead on all the regional, city, economic geography, regional economics, urban economics, research program of the Productivity Institute, which is a UK wide program plus a lot of international affiliates. It's headquartered at the University of Manchester, which is where I'm based. Um, I'm also working with the, the Institute uh, Future of Work with the Pissarides. Uh, and I regard this work program with IFO as being one of the most important work programs in the country. It's extraordinarily important because it tries to deal with some of the missing links in a lot of our narratives. So the particular interest I have is because I focus on geography. Jolene's already introduced this theme. So if we go back 10 years, between 10 and 15 years ago, we already knew, or a small number of people knew, that there were large geographical variations within the UK in terms of the standardization of work practices and contracts. There was already a geography around that Non-standard work practices in the traditional sense are really good if you're in a buoyant economy. You have a lot of autonomy, a lot of agency, you know, self-employment, flexible work practices. But in a weak economy, non-standard work practices are a disaster for those households. They have no agency or autonomy in anything to do with their life, which has huge societal effects, and we know that. In the UK, those differences were already stark in a core periphery sense. Secondly, the interregional inequalities in the UK in terms of productivity are amongst the highest in the industrialized world. That's widely accepted now. That was me that demonstrated it. Most of the institutions just simply did not believe it. It is true. And that leaves us in terms of organizational and governance matters in a very difficult position because the UK is also, on many indicators, the most centralized country in terms of governance systems. So the heterogeneity we see in our economy we have almost a uniquely ill-equipped governance system because top-down centralized governance systems work where every part of the country is more or less the same. You could be small countries like New Zealand, Finland, the Netherlands, that would be true. It would also be true in huge countries like Japan 
But in countries with huge productivity imbalances, which feed into socioeconomic imbalances on almost everything, including health issues most profoundly, life expectancy, then a top-down centralized governance system basically doesn't work. And in the UK, it doesn't work. We know that, just look at the infrastructure issue. A key part of this story that we're struggling with is all around devolution. The idea of devolution is to try and give more agency and levels which can better connect with where those challenges are and the local specificities. Finding a way to respond to those and to manage those in the ways that other countries do, and it's not just federal countries, the other large unitary societies in the OECD, Japan, South Korea, and France have all been decentralizing for nearly 30 years. They've gone in completely opposite direction to us. One of the areas we struggle with is the nature of employment. As I say, that not only standardized contracts, non-standardized, but also the productivity from those working practices and activities. How do we get those, if you like, to level up? There seem to be missing links in our institutional structure, which, for example, the Swiss, the Dutch, the Germans do routinely. They have a lot of actors in that space, particularly the, the um, chambers of commerce, that have proper legal roles to link skills training, institutions with industry demand. So you've got these two-way conversations always taking place at local and regional levels about how to move people through supply chains, value chains, different en employment pathways. We have almost none of that. And that's where one of the biggest issues is. The shocks of technology that we're talking about today are superimposed on already a very weak and fragmented foundation. That's really the biggest issue. How do we do that in a way that allows local agency to arise in those localities? That's what I'm focused on. That's why I'm working with the Institute. Thank you. Can you put one turn the sun I know my mic is on. Um, before I turn to Sana, my colleague Sana, I just want to ask if those of you sitting on the ends of the um, aisles can move slightly in to allow latecomers to get into seats. Thank you. Because with the train delays, we are having people come in. So if we can just make it easy for them to slip in to empty chairs, that would be great. Bye. Okay, Sana. Thank you, Gina. Um, uh, I just thought I'd add my infrastructure anecdote because I, I came from London, just South London, and it, uh, <laughs> while I was on the train, my train also broke down because apparently all of the Northern Line trains on the bank branch were cancelled. So, so I mean, you don't have to go far for the infrastructure to break down, right? Um, but I, I've been as. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Sana Karagani. Also very excited to be here. Um, I spent some time talking to Anna about this, um, and I'm glad that we could make it work because there's a lot going on this week, um, as I'm sure everyone is aware. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here. I was the um, the founding uh, or inaugural um, head of the UK government's office for AI. I stepped down from that role last year. I now do a number of things. One of the hats I wear is with Gina in leading the Responsible AI UK program, um, which at some point we'll, we'll talk more about or we can talk about it at a coffee break. Um, as I hear, and I think it always gets harder as you go down the panel, um, what else to add to already a rich conversation. As I'm hearing the, the, uh, my fellow panelists, I, I was kind of decide, uh, trying to think, where do I want to go? And, because I, the points I was going to make are, are along the same lines as the, my colleagues here, which was one around the skills and the, the fact that they're, they're not made equal across um, any, any kind of landscape or any kind of group of, of people. Um, I have a point around the fact that um, the term AI is massively overused and actually causes much more confusion than it, it helps um, solve. Um, I have a point around the fact that these things have been around a long time and actually we haven't, as you said yourself, we've just been kind of compiling problem on problem. Um, and also we tend to be, we tend to look at this as a brand new problem um, rather than, hey, we've kind of recognized some of these patterns. We've been here before, you know, we, we've done some of this and what did we learn and how can we build on the things that we learned? We don't do any of that. We just chuck all that out and go, right, we've got a brand new problem. How do we deal with this now afresh? Um, and then my final one is about, is, is a little bit around um, kind of striking a balance between the need for urgency and fixing things quickly versus 
actually taking a minute and a deep breath to say, what is actually happening? Can we, can we get under the skin of what's actually happening? So do we as a company, to bring it now to from, from an employer's perspective, need to rush into introducing all these technologies in order to make ourselves more productive because all our competitors are doing this and it's, it's all over the news and we've obviously missed the boat. Or are they all doing things without thinking about it as well? And I think you'll find that if you actually take that deep breath and not look just here, but across the entire world, you'll see that adoption of these technologies are actually incredibly slow. So I'm not talking about the pocket AI that we all carry around with us, right? Not our telephones, not the fact that these things are embedded into Google Maps and, and stuff like that, things that we all depend on. I'm talking about enterprises, banks, companies, any of the ones that people interact with on a daily basis, what is the actual adoption of these technologies? Um, and it's not, very, it's not very high. But even then, so there's, so there's a need for us to, to kind of take stock and, and not worry as much about going fast. So we can, we can think about that in terms of asking ourselves, just like we would with any other technical transformation, what is our challenge? Where does technology play a role in that challenge? And then, how do we do a transformation within our company? So how do we bring our employees along? Because transformations never happen well if you try and impose it on the company. They happen much better if you bring employees along and explain to them why this tech is helpful for them, for example, right? So if I put that on one side, the, the final point I wanted to make, which always when I get to here, I go, oh dear, I forgot what my final point was. <laughs> so, but the final point I wanted to make was, um, it'll come back to me, and if it doesn't, we can come back to me. <laughs> so I might just leave it there and then and move on because <laughs> I always forget my final <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thanks, Anna. I think we were on the same train. We were stuck <laughs> we're on the for a long time. <laughs> so anyway, um, so how about that? The transport. So uh, yesterday I was up in Bletchley and on the train over there uh, to another strange event everywhere. And uh, Chad, I did it, was riding such big. And in the train, I was kind of sitting down, eavesdropping, sharing this conversation with people were saying for that. So the, why do we all go to Betsy or the kind of train? And one thing did strike me, they was, the, their interest mainly was to understand the various narratives that would be formed around. And so they were interested in in the thing itself, they were interested in how this speaks stuck and spread and use. And I think for it for and that reminds me of the old story of the six men, the six uh, blind men and the elephant. And everybody has a chance to touch the elephant in a particular point. So one would touch the tusk and go, oh, it's like scared, and the other one would touch the, the tail states like a rope and so on. So you can see that there's various players blindly or deliberately are choosing to frame their approach to this technology in a particular way. Like those six by minute, it's under the end excuse light. So there are lots of I there are lots of ideologies and a lot of perspectives and a lot of blind spots being played back here. And I would just thank Anna for bring this together so that all of you play a part in understanding how these narratives play out and your role, your agency shaping those narratives so they don't run away from us, you know. Can I? Yeah. And I just want to acknowledge the the, the expertise and, and stuff that my my uh speak pad, uh, fellow panelists have already said, the infrastructure, the governance infrastructure in the UK is appalling. It is so it is terrible. I mean, I have been studying <laughs> a lot about the ESG stuff coming out from the European Union and how countries like Germany are introducing institutions to enable this change to take place. Those institutions are already and have been working on ESG for at least a decade. They are in place for both the reporting and the reacting. What have we got? And this is the same story again with the art. 
And I think for me sitting here as the head of Insight Futures for the Chartered Institute of Personnel, the, the impact of organizations is enormous because certainly organizations are going, you mean it's up to us to, to make these decisions? You mean the risks are up to us to manage? You mean the ethics and the, the fallout from a misjudgment of ethics is on us. Yeah. Without the infrastructure, without the support, without institutions on which they the position. We had a round table they are with senior HR people just last month. And they acknowledged that there were risks. They were concerned about the ethics that they had to face uh, when they embedded AI into organizational processing. Um, they acknowledged that they were responsible to monitor the impact of these technologies on the work team, on the stakeholders throughout the lifetime technology uh, and to be transparent and to be not humble about the limitations of their own capacity to monitor these technologies. And they also uh, um, acknowledge that some of these technologies are not well monitored during the way that we used AI to assist applicants to manage the talent's uh, life cycle um, and the impact it has on the employment relationship uh, going forward. So, and at the end, they, they said that whilst, whilst these are organizational concerns, they were also very concerned about the impact societally and erase things like, you know, what would happen to certain jobs? How do we make a decision from a particular skill to a new skill? You know, how do we support and handhold and provide a safety net for that position? Because if you've read Frey's book called The Age of the Machine Quet, he, he went through the experience of the Industrial Revolution and how so many people were dislocated for generations before that promised wealth came. We could face that same scenario if we don't manage this well, if we don't have the institutions to do this well, and organizations can do their part, but we will still find a lot of people left we shall end, including which is that energy for biotonic. Thank you, Wilson. If so, I remembered my last point. I, <laughs> yes, yes, please. It's a good one. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, so, so what I was talking about was to, to take a time to, to think before you move. But also there is uh, that the reason for all this is because these technologies have been a lot here a long time, they are already having an effect, making an effect on the things that we're doing and, and how we do things. So as a very quick example, we have um, filters and, and um, agents that curate all the content that we read and see online that use your data to do so. Um, and some of that will mean that you, but even before knowing whether or not a job is being posted, may never see the ad for that job, right? So part of the, the way these systems are working actually limit the number of people or the, the pool to which job ads actually arrive. And then there's all sorts of different things that then go through filtering CVs and, and so on. So we have these technologies already affecting workers and also indeed via the, the technologies we have in the office already being used. So two things need to happen, which is an awareness of where these technologies are being used. So this comes back to the skills and, and the employers. And then the right kinds of regulations that are put in place to help protect our workers and to protect the kind of things that we hold near and dear in order to, to continue having an equitable environment. And we don't have to get it right, we just have to start so that we can be agile and fix it and, and keep working on it. It doesn't have to be right, we have to start. I think starting on start yes. is, is a great idea and a, and, a, and a great point for us to land as a conversation together and inviting the four of you to come in. Um, Wilson, I just, I love the idea of, um, you know, all of these companies going around saying, you mean it's up to us. And in some ways that's a metaphor for almost everything that's been said on the panel so far of regions, Philip saying, you, 
you mean it's up to us? I, I had a conversation, I'm sure you're all having different conversations. I had a conversation with one of the one of the regions saying, well, we're gonna have our own AI safety institute because it's up to us. Okay, that's great, I think, but it's is it up to you? I mean, how how are we, you know, where are where is our starting point? And from 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 both Wilson and and Phillips, um, you know, it, it, kind of provocations, the terrain is very unequal. The terrain is um, is 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 really a kind of digital haves and have nots in many ways in in this country. And this comes to to Jolene looking at how workers then are experiencing. You know, it's, you mean it's up to me to navigate these kinds of tools and technologies? And then, and then, and then bringing, you know, Sana, I think this, you know, this kind of call to um, be thoughtful but start is, uh, you know, it's both a challenge to where we map this terrain of where we are right now and the ch challenges and changes that are happening at this moment but also where do we where do we start to build some kind of shall i say solidarity out of this right of people understanding that they're having these struggles so i don't know which one of you wants to kind of take up the starting point of where we start but what's the ground we're working with here well i think i'd like to hear from philip and and possibly wilson and son i know you've been directly involved about the institutions because that's really the thing that comes back is where is the infra infrastructure, not in terms of trains, but in terms of the institutional bodies that have some teeth, some power, some coalescing role that can, can mean that we aren't on our own in this? Because that absolutely was coming out of our surveys. Firms feel they are plowing their own field and trying to figure it out on their own. They're high risks to getting it wrong, as you've already mentioned. And I know this afternoon there's going to be some reflections on the qualitative focus group work we've done. There is so many differences in the way firms have engaged with their employees over how they've introduced the technology. So your points on it, like it's here, but did we tell anybody? Have we asked permission? Was it a was it a collective decision to progress with whichever form of technology we've introduced? And that has enormous implications for the acceptability, the extent to which people feel technologies on their team mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, on the other team. And um, and so so this acceptability determines our quality of life in the wake of all of this. So, you know, inequalities are part of that quality of life. But our lived experience day to day at work, interacting with a wide range of technologies, that too determines us our life satisfaction and shouldn't be ignored. But it seems as though we can't get into that nitty gritty without zooming right up and saying, institutions, institutions, where are they? And that's not my field, so I'd love to know more. <laughs> um, they're not there. That's, that's, that's the straight answer in the UK, and it's on multiple dimensions. Mm. You know, these are issues often, sociologists often talk about wicked problems. They, it's not something you can solve with one particular element or one particular activity or investment. You've got to do multiple things interlocking and all at the same time, or at least with a proper sequence that people understand. The difficulty in the UK at the moment is we have basically an institutional vacuum. So our governance system is an ultra pyramid. So the citizens are, feel like at the bottom, local businesses, SMEs, all the kind of foundation elements of the economy are all here. Central government's up here. There's a huge congestion problem because there's only a small number of institutions at the top that get a hearing. A pyramid maximizes the degrees of separation between everybody vertically. So you get no engagement from the bottom going upwards because one, everyone knows there's no point because there's no one to speak to. And two, even if you try, you're not going to get any kind of engagement anyway because the roadblocks. So what you get is you get no bottom up learning. What you get is top down directionality all the time. We can solve the problem. Here's the problem and here's all the directions and here's the rules. And somehow we hope that that's not gonna work. It's gonna work. The problem is it doesn't work, and actually, deep down, everyone knows it doesn't work. The problem is that I regard what they call MISO-level institutions. In federal states, you have state-level. Um, in many countries, that have that. In, in other unitary states, you have very, very devolved institutions with enormous power and which also are based on a bottom-up logic. So there's different ways of trying to solve these problems. 
But in the case of new technologies, you've got discussions around skills, around working practices, around legal issues, absolutely correct. Yeah. At the moment, we've suddenly got this rush, let's, let's give city regions these powers, but they're struggling just to deal with fairly basic things themselves. You, you add all these things on and they don't have the capacity at the moment. They don't have the resources, they don't have the legal basis to do a lot of these things. So if we want to have proper conversations about situating decision making and the legal backing to allow people to make decisions without facing these almost exorbitant risks, how do you do that? It involves a great deal of rethinking about the nature of activities and the institutional setup in which they take place. And I would refer to people, because obviously I'm focused on the geography question, there's the great schematic that comes from the, the Institute for Good, Good Work. You can go on and you can see the geography of good work in the UK, broken down locality by locality. You can go onto the website and do it. What's really remarkable is it's almost identical to the geography of opportunities with climate change mitigation. The Social Market Foundation have the best work on this using the Bayes data. So think about the need to transition all these geographical types of jobs in a way that enhances agency is also going to be built onto and partitioning with what's going on in terms of climate change mitigation agenda that we can't get away from and those imbalances if anything are going to get bigger so where is the institutional setup that we need to build to facilitate these transitions who are you having conversations with like you say firms have got no one to talk to there's no one around the table they can't go to whitehall and westminster because there's no hearing what you need is people who are much more situated in the localities where you can start to build systems. At the moment, they don't exist. If I may come in yeah. very quickly. Um, um, just before you do, if I may, um, there are questions on the Slido. The Slido um, number here is 1714449. So post questions to the Slido and I'll take some of those from there. Sana. Thank you. Um, just to. Uh, you know, I spent five years in, in government heading up the Office for AI, and before that I, um, I, was, I, I was at Government Digital Service taking some of the, the, the kind of services um, and putting them online and stuff. So um, I've been working in government for some time, and it's interesting what you say, um, because I'm, I'm also Canadian, where we do have provincial government, and, and you know, we have uh, a federal government. Um, and it, it, you see the, the shortcomings of both systems very quickly. Um, where, uh, you know, and, and, and the, 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 the fact that, you know, I think you, you, you said it very well, um, there's very good reason why there isn't a government front door, right? Um, uh, you know, and we used to say the office for AI, like I used to say to the team, you know, I want the office for AI to be the, the AI front door, right? So if you had an AI question, at least it came to us and then we'd punt it to the right place because it's, you know, it, it, it's important to have that that kind of conversation. Um, it isn't because, but uh, but just to stand up for it, there there tends to be more from uh, it's it's tends tends to be more from uh, the the overabundance of work rather than conspiracy that things don't happen, um, and there tends to be that a lot of the work is happening but isn't told or isn't explained, um, doesn't come out and communicated. I mean, even a lot of the the kind of misunderstandings. Um, around this specific summit, for example, are from miscommunication or just lack of communication because of being run off your feet. Um, but having said all that, I think the feedback loop needs to be much stronger. Um, and some of that, uh, the onus is on policymakers to ensure they're getting the perspective from a wide enough array of people. And some of it, I would uh, suggest, given that we are where we are, and it'll take a long time to move to a place where we have a much more, uh, much better kind of circular comms, um, needs people to come together and help uh, the civil servants or help the policymakers by by writing white papers, by making noise, because it it does actually work that that does it is heard and it is acted on um and you know for for my part being 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 inside um 
just making noise isn't good enough. Making noise with answers is much help, much more helpful. So surveys like you discussed, showing that there is um, empirical evidence. You know, this kind of thing is actually unbelievably useful to policymakers because they will put that together and put it forward as, as policy that's needed. So that hearing from you is so, so, so important. Um, and this is just, you know, I'm not in government anymore, but this is this was my key takeaways as somebody who is sitting in government trying to make policy. Listen. Thanks. Um, when I was in government, I was working in the uh, science technology development field. And one of the things, you know, ICT then and AI now are cross-cutting. They impact education, they impact bad parts, okay, people power. <laughs> We've had so many parts of, of government which operate in silos. Right? So, so one of the things that happened was they created a national council where it was chaired by the prime minister. And then they had the relevant ministers sitting in so that the conversation started in, in policy terms there. The prime minister this is interesting. I think we should investigate it. The minister would say, yes, sir, we would do that. So, there was a coordination in the development plans for ICT because there was the sponsorship, there was the level of seriousness, and there was a formal structure. Given that for the UK, we have to build some kind of structure for ESG, right? We move to transition to this, we are legally bound, we need to build those institutions. If we follow the lead of the European Union, we can actually piggyback that institutional framework because their regulations make anything that impacts their citizens like human rights issue and technology impacts the citizen and must therefore be monitored or to the bottom. So there is a risk safety governance issue from that perspective already. Since we have to build something, Let's build something that works because we cannot just build a, ministry, a department of AI. That would be ridiculous, right? We need to look at how this cross cuts um, because all the different things that impact citizens' lives. I think that's great. Oh, now I'm on. To, now I'm on. Now I didn't want that order. Now it's not. Good. Thank you. I, I have a, I have a funny switch. I have to switch. Sort of like some of this, this tech we're talking about that works sometimes, it doesn't work other times. Um, one of the questions that's come from the audience through Slido is, um, is, is talking, um, uh, it's from David Wood. Um, what, um, on, on where, uh, so, sorry, um, I'm looking at the wrong one, but this is from Oliver. Um, I'm a what, um, what 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 is the what are the root causes of this institutional gap that we have? Is there a way I'm adding on to the question? Is there a way that we can um, tech our way out of this? Can is there is there is there hope for how new digital technologies help make us fix some of these problems, or are there other steps we have to do first in order to take full advantage of the technologies we're talking about? Can I augment the question one more step and ask, Sona, you mentioned we've been here before, we've got to think about history, and have we done it successfully before in, in, a, in a similar sort of transition? So just wanting to add to the question right. rather than help with the right. answer. Absolutely. Sorry. I don't think we've done it well before. <laughs> I mean, I, and maybe this is, but I do think there are lessons that we can learn from, right? We have had technology that has displaced people in the past, right? And we haven't done a good job of thinking about what happens to the community when technology displaces what was holding that community together in the first place. We haven't done that well, right? And, and something like that is happening at a much quicker speed, right? I talked about the adoption is taking a lot longer, but actually the the rate of digitization and the, the move towards needing fewer people because we're just becoming more productive and that kind of thing is, is happening more quickly. Um, 
And so I do think looking back and saying, you know, what could we have done better? And, and to be honest, my, my answer when, when you back this out always ends with skills. It's mm -hmm. skills, 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 right? It's making sure the, that, um, at, that we all take that onus upon ourselves, right? So this isn't asking the question and it isn't me putting onto the citizen, right? So now that you've got your you know, doctoral degree in, in medicine because you need to self-diagnose because you can't get to the GP and you've got Google mm -hmm. to, to help you with that, now go off and you know get your PhD in in you know data science and, and AI because now you need to understand what's happening to your data and and when to say yes to the consent things and you know that's what I mean because that that is what's happening right it's not what we want but that is what we are doing is we're basically saying to the citizen right here's another lot of stuff you need to go and learn but I think that the onus is on every one of us along this journey right for us. To, to do the hard work to make it easier to understand. So what is it that we're trying to, to talk about? And this is where the whole term AI, I think, needs to be you know, mm -hmm. shelved. Um, so that's one. The citizens themselves need to know where to go. So we need to do the work to figure out well, what is it that we're, we're teaching them. There's an onus on government, on, for policymakers, for to to understand what's happening to get up to speed right so you know there I, I heard somebody yesterday and i thought this was brilliant talk about the fact that there is a lot of policymakers who've been surged from all parts of government into the department for science innovation and technology to work on the ai summit right um and they said isn't this a really brilliant and positive thing because they have all come in they've all upskilled on on this area of policy, which they wouldn't have otherwise, right? The problem is the summit will end, they'll go back to their J jobs and their view of AI will remain November, 2023, right? right? So how do we keep the information fresh, right? And now that isn't just at citizens and workers, but across this entire thing, how do we do that? And that, that's a question and I think if we're going to learn anything from history, that's got to be it. Yeah, Philip. You, you asked how, how we got in this situation. Well, it was three steps. They were all political and they were all uncoordinated for different reasons, different times, perfectly well, well intentioned with a logic. The first one was under the Thatcher government and it was a response to the, the fiscal crisis of local governments, primarily the, the Liverpool city. Uh, issue the, where the, the local councillors there was a question about would they are they willing to um, break the fiscal rules from the government My, if you look at the data it suggests that that's where the first mark shift is this is the Hulk and Marx data that some of you may be familiar with that basically under, under the Thatcher government they're basically much more centralized control for fiscal and monetary management of sub-central government so that was the first big step of centralization. The second step was under the Blair Brown government, it was the public service agreements. Because there was a fear in the government that the financial markets would get very nervous about labor, income in labor government, because <coughs> reputations about spending and so on. So basically the public service agreements, in a sense built on the increasing centralization which had already happened, and that allowed a lot of ministerial fiat where ministers were directly intervening in what was going on locally with really no coordination activities at all, just intervening all the time to make sure what had taken place locally was in agreement with what they thought. And then the third stage was, if, if you want to call it austerity or whatever, under Cameron Osborne, that most adversely impacted on local government in weaker places. But that's not the only reason. It's actually in three stages. And the whole mark state you see very clearly. So we've ended up in this situation for a series of different political decisions which are dependent on things that were happening at that time, mm -hmm. not with any particular overview. In terms of Whitehall itself, I mean, I, I find this, I do a lot of work with Whitehall. And in fact, tomorrow I'm meeting with all the cross government teams, the city growth teams, yeah. talking to them about the, all the leveling up agenda. I mean, they have tremendous expertise, but they're, they're often tasked with doing things which are simply impossible given the institutional system that we have. That's the problem. Um, and it's the MISO level. Where is the space that people can come together? 
And this is where I take a different view. There are some people who think we can sort of AI ourselves out of these problems. Right. Right. I think it's absolutely impossible because for things like AI, I tend to think in terms of advanced technologies, industry 3.0, 4.0, of which you could throw AI in, whatever. Fundamentally, deliberative processes are building agreements between people for courses of action, <coughs> generating legitimacy, and the legal infrastructure to allow steps to be taken forward where you can build a consensus, some sort of consensus. Those are the critical things. They're not things you can solve with technology. Even more, they require people sitting around a table. You know, salience, legitimacy, credibility. Those are the three things we know from all the work of the National Academy of Sciences, for example. Those three things are critical, and that can only come about through deliberative processes. The difficulty in the UK is the institutional imbalances between the centre and everyone else makes those deliberative processes almost impossible. It's not, a, it's not a blame on anybody at all. It's just a product of political decisions which were taken at different time periods, different eras, different decades for different reasons. But we've ended up in a very difficult space. I want to bring both Wilson and Jolene in on this. So um, I know you're talking to organizations and maybe you've got ideas from the employees of your survey. So I'll just <clears throat> respond to your question about you know whether it is possible. And I think yesterday, one of the conversations I had they talked about how AI could um, increase the diversity and the voice at citizens at the subject level. So at that level, getting uh, building consensus using AI is possible. The question is, what then do you do with that voice, right? And you ask what actually works. And I would say in the UK, I observed that inquiries work very well. Mm. They are very well structured. They're led by a very skilled chair, and the scope is very clear. But then what happens to those recommendations? So they face the same institutional black hole that citizens assemblies would. So, and I don't think any amount of technology will help that because we have a system which is adversarial, which is uh, siloed, and it is deliberately so, you know, for good reason. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't lend itself to those processes of inquiry recommendations ever making it to statute or to institutional action, nor for sitting the assembly to happen. So in the CIPD, we spent a lot of time lobbying government on various things, you know, better calls of success because it wasn't politically tricky, you know, but all those things that require pain in the last uh -huh. seven years has been kicked down, you know, the never-ending road. So we've not had a political decision in the last seven years of any input. So, so for us, you know, we go like this, right? Chambers of Congress, everybody goes to one point, Prime Minister's change every second day. I mean, what exactly <laughs> do you do to change anything? I don't know. Yeah. And so maybe coming back to think about... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very happy to, to reflect kind of even further down the ecosystem into firms and within individual workers. And the making pattern that we're seeing is a lot of variation. Of course, within some, the, the very small firms, you can have organic communication, but once you get into larger environments, your HR policy matters, your institutions matter. The way that management interacts with employed groups matters. Mm -hmm. And there is no standardization of that. Right. And it's important, it's not that it's not important that it's standardized, but it's important that the approach is thoughtful, that it that a conversation begins. And I know Max is going to touch much more on this this afternoon in a later panel. But in our focus group discussions, we had employees that were actively enthusiastic about the adoption of a wide range of technologies within their workplaces. Oh, it's a sign that our firm is competitive and successful. And when we started digging down, those are the firms who engaged with their employees in a human conversation about how the technology will be introduced, will augment what they do, will support their roles, will take the boring stuff out, will leave them to focus on the good stuff. So that was done in collaboration through a set of conversations around the table to make sure that the technology worked for the organization and the people in that organization. Others were much more concerned about being surveilled, weren't quite sure about whether their jobs might be replaced, ended up with the boring jobs of turning the machines on and off, 
Mm. It was their conversation. Yes. So I think that what we're what we're saying at a macro level about the shortcomings of hey, government hasn't got their act together, and we need some decentralization and institutions. That's true at a firm level too. And and actually, we need we need to roll out an ecosystem of of process of conversation mm. that and that might be the way to start. I mean, it, you know, I don't know where we'll end up with it, but maybe that's the way to start. Well, this is a good place to start the rest of our day. I just want to add a quick note that I've been working on a book called Negotiating Innovation, where we really are seeing that it is the workers at the coal face of technological change who, in negotiation with each other, with their companies, and yes, with the institutional configurations in which constrain and enable their work, they are the ones who are pushing for changes in rules. They are the ones who are changing, pushing for changes in governance that work for them. Right. And they're the ones actually figuring out how to make the technology work, how to make the topic of today, how to make the future work. They're the ones doing them. That. But at an individual level. So, so, so some form of collective action, <clears throat> I don't know, it's a slightly um, controversial term, but how do they do that with a voice? Exactly. How can we raise that mm -hmm. and, 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 and see the, yep. the, the, the benefits of these changes on a, on, a, on a scale? So this is just the beginning of our conversation. I know we got a little bit of a late start, but I would like for all of you to join me in thanking our panel. <laughs> <laughs>